Hello, I'm Jay Harriman, past president of AECT from 2003 to 2004. Recently, I had the distinct privilege of visiting with another past president from an earlier era in our association's history. Mendel Sherman was president of DAVI, the forerunner of AECT, in 1964 and 65, a time when the organization was one of few involved in the field. Mendel began his career teaching with his wife in a one-room country school outside Cincinnati, Ohio in the 30s, and later completed a master's thesis outlining a program of audiovisual education for the Cincinnati schools. While an assistant principal during World War II, he was drafted in the Army and later trained as a combat motion picture cameraman. He was assigned to the European theater during the famous Battle of the Bulge and attained the rank of captain, and eventually headed up all of the training film libraries for the Army in the field. After the war, he returned to the Cincinnati schools as supervisor of the Audiovisual Center, and during that time, Life Magazine selected six schools nationwide, including Cincinnati, to televise classroom instruction, highlighting what was going on inside our schools at the time. Later, using the GI Bill, he enrolled in the doctoral program at the University of Southern California, studying with a major force in the IT field, Jim Finn. After his return, he accepted a position at Indiana University where he helped coordinate the film library, teach AV courses, consult on a major project with Thailand in the late 50s, and eventually head the IST department before his retirement in 1975. At the time of this interview, Dr. Sherman, an avid user of video technology to this day, decided to provide a significant contribution to AECT to help support a joint project with Phi Delta Kappa that has its roots in his early experiences in classroom education. Mendel believes students today have the tools and the skills to develop their own video stories of what is going on inside our schools to provide advocacy and support for good education. Join me now as we take a look at this recent visit with Mendel Sherman. You can look back to the time too when we had, we had tools and software that was peculiar to our organization. And uh, the, such things as a 60 millimeter projector, that's, mm -hmm. people don't hardly remember that anymore. But anyhow, this project gives us something that we can tie into that I think extends the dimensions of AECT. Uh, this is our, can be our field. We have the, we have the, uh, the know-how to make the motion pictures. And we're going to apply that to the classroom and give the schools and uh, the community something they really haven't had before, and that's to interpret what goes on in their schools, their schools, to the community, to the gatekeepers, to people in the Rotary Club, the uh, different clubs, the churches, and so on. They're going to see what goes on in a classroom in a typical unit of work, many at, in, in, in over the long range of things. But anyhow, the inside our schools is going to be made by students. We have so many of them now that are pretty good camera people, and we want them to apply their skills to a special category within the uh, media, student media uh, festival. And this category will be one that is inside our schools type that PDK, Phi Delta Cap would like to have. It will show what the teacher does, what the, children's do, what the children do, what materials they use under what circumstances. And we'll show that to the public instead of trying to tell them. Yeah, well, I think the most immediate answer would have to be this. When I was in the Cincinnati schools, we got two days a year when we could visit another place and see what a teacher was doing. And um, the supervisor asked me to see, I said, well, I wasn't teaching quite the way she would like. So she had me visit another school where the focus was on the learner. Where they, this, uh, at the, when I went to see that, she had a summation of what they had done and different committees would report. And I got so much out of those two days, it changed my teaching. And after I got back, I thought, I wish I could have seen the development of that unit. 
when you go out and visit and you're there for even two hours, you only get a little piece of what went on. And so I thought if you could have a motion picture that would show different stages of development. And so I wrote an article that appeared in Educational Screen. Do you know about Educational Screen? That was the forerunner of our magazines we have now. It was called the, uh, the film for purposes, the school-made film for purposes of supervision of instruction. It was really for a consultant, but we called them the people supervisors that came out. Of the, so we, I mentioned the word supervisor in the film, but it was doing exactly the same. Show the development of a unit so that instead of going out for two days in a year, I could turn on a projector and see the whole development of the unit. And so back in 1940, I wrote it in 1941 before I went in the Army, but it finally appeared in 1944, the school made film for purposes of inside our schools we're doing now. In 1951, Life magazine and local station and about six school systems in this country put on a program that they called Inside Our Schools. And they came to Cincinnati and asked if we would be one of them when they would come into our classroom for a week, as a, for a half day, and televise what was going on right in the schools. That was called Inside Our Schools, so the superintendent turned the whole program into my department. And I had to help select the teachers and arrange the whole thing and then do the commentary in a remote truck while they were in the classroom. At first they were going to do it, but the superintendent got cold feet of what they might say. And so he said, I want you to do it. So I had a wonderful experience of sitting in the remote with a supervisor of the particular subject area we were in and a uh, number one station announcer. And then I had notes and I would talk and the supervisor would help me with know what to say. And then the station announcer would tell me how how to talk. So that all led up to this and when I saw the effect of that upon the community, they were able to go right inside our schools and they had tremendous cameras that they had to lift in and carry to the next room. It was quite a story. But anyhow, I would say those were two of the things that contributed to this idea of we want to show the community what's going on in the schools. So the tools were different 50 odd years ago. But today, you think uh, with even the newer tools and the and the little different spin on it is that the students would actually be making these videos that would provide the same message uh, to the community. That's right. Um, I th in 1949, I made a film in the Cincinnati schools at the request of the committee of uh, elementary teachers. They would like to see new teachers coming in see scenes that would help them in their teaching and at the same time would tell the public what we're doing. So we made that little film called um, What Makes Plants Grow in the Second Grade and in it they saw the focus upon the learner mm -hmm. in which they were doing work and the teacher was a guide and a counselor and all the things that a teacher can do to help. It showed the materials, it showed audiovisual materials being integrated and so on. And that uh, film was made in, in 1949 and used shortly after I went to the University of Southern Cal, so I didn't see all the uses. But uh, it did so much good that I'd like to have, at that time, I thought it'd be wonderful if schools could all make it to show their local community the way we did that film. We showed it to Rotary Clubs, the parents groups, the teachers, had many uses, curricular uses too. And I thought it would be fine if, we, if all schools could do that. But I realized they didn't have the kind of training. But then, a couple of years ago, it dawned on me when I began the Saudi Media Festival. Yes, they've got the camera skills, most of them, a lot of them. Uh, and what they need to do is to apply this to the special kind of a film. Not the dramatizations they were showing and making the other kind, but the very special kind of a film. I guess teaching the grades and wanting the children to understand and see. And of course, when you think you want them to understand, you want them to see. And then my wife was a right brain person, being an artist. And she realized that right from the beginning, she was co-oping with me. We, in this one-room country, then a two-room country, and then a four-room. 
that's where we worked our way through school. We would cooperate. She would teach art and geography and so on. And she very early uh, in our career, she started going down to the Cincinnati Public Library on a Saturday and bringing back a bunch of keystone slides, mm -hmm. three and a quarter by four. And that, and when I saw the uh, effect upon the kids, of, I wanted to be as good a teacher as she was. So I began to look into it, and then I looked into the idea of 16 millimeter, they were just beginning to come in, and they had a state repository. So I got interested in the 16 millimeter motion picture especially. And uh, then in the late 30s, um, I wrote a master's degree uh, thesis on a v program of visual education for the Cincinnati Public Schools. I had been in the schools a couple of years and uh, wrote that. I learned something that if you get there early, you don't have to be so good. <laughs> and so my, my master's thesis, because it was so new, was judged to be something that the, it suggested I write into a book, some book company. Yes, so after I felt that preparing that, that master's was a step. Then when I was drafted in the military, I ended up eventually uh, after basic training, and I won't go through all the details, but I was sent for training as a combat motion picture cameraman and officer. We went to Astoria to some old studios that the Army had bought, and for four months I was put through a training that was the most wonderful to be in the army and to get that training and to live on 93rd Street with my wife at night. It just was unbelievable to be in the army. But officers sometimes get a break. So I went out every day and learned to shoot motion pictures and bring, bring back the basic shots, the elements that make up a motion picture. And uh, you, you knew what you were supposed to do in the first two days, but you found out that you had to go out and do it shoot it over and over again so that as soon as you saw a scene, you could see your different elements that you're going to put together. So um, that was another thing that led up to my interest in the field. And I, may, I think I mentioned earlier that you ended up as an officer in charge of the Signal Corps. Oh, yes. Center. I was sent across during the Battle of the Bulge. Does the Battle of the Bulge mean anything Absolutely. to you? Absolutely. Uh, they had lost six of our Signal Corps officers. They didn't know where they were. So they grabbed six of us that were in the last part of our training and sent us over on the Queen Elizabeth. And uh, when we got over there, they lost us in the replacement depot. We traveled all through Europe wondering when we were going to be picked up and sent to our assignment. When they finally found us, they sent us up to Paris to, to, uh, to be reassigned. And while I was up there, they put me for work temporarily in the film library, the main one. We had the branches all over by that time. And I won't go into what happened, but I got breaks all the way through the Army on that and ended up being in charge of all the Signal Corps training film libraries in the European theater. Talking about the early research, I don't know how familiar with this old one. This, this is instructional research back from 19... Yeah. And the research was on what films could do in the Army to training you and how to clean a rifle, how to do combat. But they could use some of that today. When you get into a village, how do you do a ladder movement moving down? Had films in medicine, basic training in for combat um, medical training. And when I went through that course for four months. So after the war, did you return to the Cincinnati schools to serve as the director of the audiovisual program for the school system? Yes, that was in 1947, after four years in the Army. And I went back and was, and, uh, and was in that program, supervisor of the Audiovisual Center at that time. Well, you see, there was something free hanging around there, and that was a, you know, that, uh, what was that, the GI Bill. So after five years in, in uh, Cincinnati, a very interesting five years, and it included that moving into the schools, you know, with television. So I'd been through films, through television, and so on. And I felt there were two things that, there was that GI Bill, and then I began to feel the desire to go on and learn more. And Jim Finn was out in Southern California, 
And uh, so I got a leave of absence for a year. And after I got out there, it was wonderful having nothing but study as my occupation for the first time in my life. It was just working on a program. What did you do your dissertation topic? Yeah, well, that grew out of my work in Cincinnati. And when we, when I got into the program, and with all the details, but I insisted there were certain things I was going to be free to do. I didn't like the idea of the supervisor or the exchange selecting the films. I wanted the teachers and supervisors to select them. So I'd have committees. I had 16 different committees coming in. And it could be high school English and so on. And we'd come in and I'd say, you know, what are you doing? What are your needs? And so they would help decide what the, among the films were available they'd like to see. We'd order them in for them to view. Then we would discuss it. But they had a lot of trouble coming down to the exchange. They had to come from the schools there. And I thought at that time, if we could get the films on television, they could view them at home, would they be able to give the same evaluation that they gave as a group to select them? So my, even though I was taking a Southern Cal, I was taking cinema courses, television courses, and so on, I did the, uh, the uh, dissertation on, on that topic. Could teachers individually, sitting at home, give an evaluation that would get us to purchase the same film as if they were in a group talking it over. Hmm. And so I got, while well, I was in L.A., at the, I got stations to televise the films, and the teachers would evaluate them at home. To do that, I had to develop an evaluation form and called eventually the Sherman Evaluation Form because it was the only validated one that they really had. And they had said things as, how does it fit the curriculum and the level of interest and so on. And that was used to evaluate the films. Midway in that, the Cincinnati schools, superintendent called me when they come back home to, because they were putting television in schools and he wanted to be in my department. And I said, I've got to finish my dissertation there. So they said, well, if you come home, we'll give you a couple of secretaries and you can televise from the Cincinnati stations. So I went back, and the most horrendous year of my life, to get the television in and working on my dissertation, and my poor wife on a tractor out doing the work that I'd been doing on the little <laughs> nine-acre farm we had. Well, anyhow, that was the, um, it was uh, the, I'm trying to remember the title of it, but it was the use of television to evaluate instructional films. And we found the results were that except on one color film, the evaluations were the same, whether they were at home or meeting in the group. Anyhow, I went back to Cincinnati and was involved in everything. Everything was great. Then I got this uh, offer from Ole Larson they came to Indiana University, called me on the phone, and told me something what the job would be about. It was interesting. But uh, he said he'd send me a letter. I said, I think. Then I got off the phone and I said to Martha, Martha, why did I tell him to write a letter? We're happy here. We got a, like our little farm. We like our job. And you're at the university. And she said, and I guess it's three, one of the reasons why we've been married 77 years, she said, I know what it is to be offered an associate professorship right off the bat. And it's your field, and the university is the greatest. So she said, uh, I go where you go. You make up your mind. And the more I thought of it, we went down and we looked the place over. I think I'm wandering a little bit. But um, the offer was to come and be spend half my time in charge of the film library, which was the old stuff, and the other half of my time in academic in teaching and so on. And so... Uh, what kinds of courses did you teach? Did I teach? Well, I started teaching the basic course. And it was very pleasurable because I could work out the whole course. And it was getting them, the students, acquainted with all the different media. See, it was a nice field. What could the motion picture do? What could these do? And as a final assignment, they had to each make a presentation using a variety of materials on the topic that they selected. The only, he was a fascinating person, I think, a little a recognized uh, uh, person in the field. That he did things there that nobody else did. 
You see, he, he came in about 1940. He said, if I can have a film library that rents films and we take in more than the cost that we need enough to buy a new film, but I can use that money to give assistantships and so and put these people at work, some in the film library, some with different professors. So, And at one time we had as many as over 50 assistantships, which enabled a lot of people to come to school that wouldn't have. And my, part of my job was as they came in, I would talk to them, and if they needed an assistantship and they were good material, they would get that. And a very pleasurable part of my job was to listen to these students come in and tell me about their career and how they saved and saved to come to the university and needed just another $1,500 to go. But it was the cost of the 16 millimeter film that started the whole audiovisual center. Started that ours in Cincinnati and all over. The, uh, the increasing number of films that had curricular value with Britannica films and Coronet and so on were so great that teachers were wanting them, principals were wanting them. But the schools couldn't afford the $50 a reel, color reel. Now, that doesn't sound like much now, but back in 1939, $50 was an awful lot of money. That was for the 10 minute color film. And so they said, we ought to have an exchange. And so it was called the Visual Aids Exchange at first, where we'd have enough money to buy the films and then have a way of getting them out to the schools for their use. And so in Cincinnati, we got what we called the Pony Express. We had a couple of trucks that ran around delivering the films. Well, while they were doing that, we had them deliver other audiovisual materials, a suitcase museum that we designed. Uh, the film strips and so on. And the theory was, uh, of course, that uh, learn more in less time and then see the world as it really is and that you couldn't get it all through words. You had to see it. And everybody was, uh, uh, was in agreement with that. And so the uh, field grew fast, but the problem was money to buy films and for the schools to get projectors. So. It was a 50 millimeter, the $50 film that really started our, if it had been a videotape then for a couple of dollars, I don't think there'd ever been any visual center. We began, uh, the people, the early people in charge of these programs had a background in science curriculum and we weren't satisfied to just deliver the films. We were interested in how they were going to be used. And so we talked about, here's how you introduce a film. Here's how you clear up misconceptions. And our writings were a good bit in how to use the materials to do better what you're already doing. As far as designing a whole new approach, which I think uh, design people do nowadays in some cases, we were not so much involved in that. It was helping teachers do better what they're already doing. I guess the first one was Edgar Dale. Edgar Dale was Ohio State. I was at, 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 in Cincinnati. And I had read some of his early materials. And so I wrote to him. And um, he uh, did some advising on a sort of an individual course that I took with him from Cincinnati. And, but his writings and his thinking in the field and his cone of experience meant a lot yes. to, at that time. You remember the base of it is a direct purposeful experience. Moving on up to the abstract. To the abstract. Yeah. And that made sense at the time. And I used his course. And then um, Jim Finn was a great influence when I went to Southern Cal. Uh, Ole Larson on another way. He was a great entrepreneur. And some things he did to get his library started, nobody else would have thought of. For example, in Ole Larson, I learned a lot of maneuvering from Ole Larson. He had the idea that if he could get a couple hundred thousand dollars to start a film library and rent them out, that he would get this whole concept of getting money in and, um, and support uh, graduate students. And he likened it to a, to a medical profession, which you go out and get internships. But how do you get into the president that they explained this to him? 
Herman Wells is in demand all over in, uh, uh, at that time. And they couldn't get into his office, so he asked his secretary. He knew that the president flew to Washington, D.C. quite a bit. So he went into his secretary and says, when is his next flight to Washington? And she told him, and lo and behold, when he got on the plane and sat down, who was sitting next to him but Ole Larson. He had two hours with President Wells, and in that time he convinced him of the whole program, and Ole even had him sign a paper that he could take to the treasurer and get his 200000 get going. Now, not many people would have, would have done that. And all the way through, Ole was maneuvering. When I came in, he had already had an idea of taking the program all through the state. And he put me in charge of working up a program where we'd visit school systems. And the way he got a superintendent to agree to a certain date when he would call all of his teachers together while we put on the program was something I think, that, another thing I learned from Ole Larson. Um, then my colleagues, you know, people like Bob Heine, and um, the people who wrote the uh, book on message design. That was one of the great things about Indiana University. You had so many colleagues who brought so much to you. And uh, then AECT had a lot of people. When we'd have our annual meeting, I would meet Charlie Schuler and Walt Wittig. And uh, later, uh, Ken Gustafson was a student at first at the time. But uh, these were all people whose names may not appear at so quickly, that had a great influence on me. When did you actually uh, become a member of AECP, or at the time, DAVI? I was in 1947, mm -hmm. so it's been exactly 60 years. 60 years. And, uh, it meant, uh, by the way, I almost unveiled a picture when I was president. Uh, AECP had meetings all over on the NDEA Act. I was 19. And um, they um, were meeting with different schools, so they took a picture of me at the time I was president. Uh, we signed uh, witness the signature of President Johnson, mm -hmm. and they, and so uh, different uh, groups that had who had association with the act and going to work benefit from it came into the White House, and they have a picture of President Johnson signing. And Ann Heyer, who was the, um, the executive director, and I were standing at his shoulder. And they had that picture. And then I got the pen. See, he, when he signed, you know how they sign their name? Yeah. Just make a little of a dot. And then another one. And by the time he gets through, he's finally finished his name. So I have a pen. And um, they made a big five by um, tremendous picture. And they took that around to him at every place and showed a picture of President Johnson signing it. And then Ann Heyer and me. And when they got through, they, they put it on top of a Jeep and drove all the way back to Bloomington and gave me the picture. And I covered it up and tied it up and carried it with me wherever we went, but it's, it's still covered up behind the door. During the year I was president, we were concerned with standards. That is, what should the, the school have? What should the school system have? But especially the school, what should they have in the way of equipment, materials, personnel, and so on? And so we were concerned with standards. Uh, we were also concerned with getting the voice of DAVI out there to other non-media organizations. And we talked about how we could have people from our organization go and meet with them and tell them what the AVI was about, what we were trying to do and helping them with their, the curriculum people and so on. Those are two of the main ones. Of course, there was the issue of what kind of training programs should we have for our personnel. We were still developing courses, and we were branching out into such courses as a diffusion of ideas, and we were getting into psychology more and so on. We were actually pulling in people from psychology. So that uh, uh, the whole field of what we're trying to do with visual aids for evaluation, talking about evaluation, uh, training our people for evaluation. I think those are among the major ones. What about the organization uh, at the time? What was the size of the membership? What was the budget like? Uh, where, were you, where was the headquarters? I, I'm assuming it was in Washington. 
Yes, it was in Washington, D.C. And you know, at first we were part of NEA, but then we branched off. NEA was paying for our director and assistant director, but then they stopped doing that. And we branched off, but we were in Washington, D.C. And at the time I was president, we had 9,000 members. But I think a lot of them were part of a membership drive where everybody was out there. We got people who weren't going to really stay in. Uh, teachers, there were some teachers, there were principals and so on. I think it'd be fine if AECT had a, a track for those people. Right now, I think our, how many members do we have now? About 2,500. They're pretty well people at the university level and, and uh, school district level. Right. Uh, we don't have a lot going for people outside of this. I read our professional magazine and so on. It's really directed. We talk about K-12, but we're talking about what we would do with K-12, not what the teacher does. I wish there was some way that AECT would branch into getting to the teachers. Now, I believe that the making of these films will be one way. You see, the teachers want to tell their best story. The principals do. And if it's AECT people, and a lot of the AECT people are at the university, are working with them, helping train, they're setting up workshops for the teachers and the students and focusing on what is learned. I think we could get a separate track for people in there who are looking at this as curriculum materials. The standards we were concerned, and I think they participated in this, but the standards we were concerned with at the time, we didn't go into library materials at all, it was the AV materials, the, the films and the film strips and the, the uh, flat pictures and the audio and so on. And, but the, the standards were aimed a good bit at the, what equipment do you have to have, what personnel do you have to have, uh, what kind of training but it was a good bit quantitative thing. Was there a publication that arose out of that uh, effort to identify those uh, equipment standards? Oh yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Gene Ferris and I, who eventually ended up in the president's office at Indiana University, and I got a grant, and we went around to different schools, and we came up with standards. And I think it was under Gene's name that the um, Audiovisual instruction had their first set of standards. People don't realize that. They sort of forgotten that because later on the librarians came along. But as a result of our study, the field had their first set of standards and it was uh, published. If you look back in audiovisual instruction, you'll find it. But again, it was pretty much quantitative. Back in the 1960s, I remember at Indiana University, a group of us were looking at a videotape, and it had gotten down to the size where it can now be bought. And I looked at that, and the thought struck me, and I said, you know, this is the end of our film library. And he said, you're crazy, what do you mean? I said, well, I don't know how long it'll take, but our library is based on the fact that the films are expensive. That is something you don't always realize. Expensive, when they get down cheap enough, and people don't have to rent them, they're going to get them this way. I thought that it would take about five years. It took many, many years. That was back in the 60s. When I left in 75, the film library was still going fairly strong. But eventually it was the cheaper materials that killed it. Now I'm afraid that they killed a number of things with it that were desirable. And that was, we worked with showing how you would use the materials. There was the introduction and the follow-up, and, and uh, in 1940, I remember, I uh, wrote another article for, uh, for Educational Screen. It was using a film to correlate your different subjects, and I had a second grade teacher take the film Gray Squirrel. It was a 10-minute film, Gray Squirrel. Kids loved it, and she did everything, their exercises, everything, and showed how you would correlate with uh, the, the film became a stimulus for a lot of other activities. Where is that now? I don't know. What are the tools that they have in the school now? I could go into school not too many years ago and they're still using films. They also had film strips that are little stations and kids would be studying film strips. 
or set of slides. Now the computer, and I thank the Lord he let me live to see the computer, that wonderful computer. But what has it chased out of the simpler things that we were doing? I don't know. But uh, the future of the field, what did the can become in the future? I'm a little uncertain. As you pointed out, we don't have the field anymore like we had when it was tied to the equipment and we could use that as a means to get to other things. Now our field is sort of part of it has disappeared in that the materials, the, the computer, which is a big thing, that's everybody's. That's not ours. But we use the computers and how we apply it is what makes our field. It's how we take any of these ideas and apply it to learning. But again, other organizations are moving on. The curriculum people, especially, because we were, we were largely curriculum. And as, as a um, result of my work in the film world, uh, the film world the, when I was in Indiana one year, Cincinnati contacted me and asked me if I would come back, not as audiovisual director, but as a su assistant superintendent in charge of curriculum. Because our people were recognized for, uh, for um, the curriculum work. So what do I see in the next five years? I'm hoping this inside of our schools can give us a thrust now. We've got a chance to get something as peculiar to our field that others don't have. And that's this whole filmmaking as it relates to the curriculum. And I think all of our people would do well to learn the language of the film. When I retired, we came up here, we retired in 75, but we didn't come up here until 86. And in 1986, I brought my video equipment. I had done some work on the, when I retired down on, um, on the island, uh, I was videographing some tennis, Martha tennis court, the tennis was great. The, uh, and um, I devised a little contraption, a tennis stroke shaper, which um, I got a patent on, oh. um, but I, I never used it. But anyhow, a young professional down there made tr fantastic use of it, and I made a film um, of the tennis stroke shaper and showing how we had old classes of film of uh, students come in, and it was a uh, swing suspended uh, with Velcro, held the ball until they hit it, you know, and, and we hit it into a Y, and we taught all kinds of strokes with it. Um, then I made that video. When I came up here in 86, I started to photograph some of our people called Know Your Neighbor. We had some very interesting people here. And I ran into one, they told me about one, a man by the name of Douglas Lawrence, who was a uh, World War I veteran. He was 92 years old. And as I got further acquainted with him, I felt he was one of the great heroes of World War I. He got the Medal of Honor, he got the Corps de Guerre. He wrote the book, The Fighting Soldier, which is a definitive role of the fighting soldier, which is on, at West Point. It's a hair-raising book of what he did in cleaning out machine gun nests, some of them single-handedly. So I went down and I interviewed Doug Lawrence and got a picture of the Corps de Guerre and so on. And uh, 10 years later, a group talked me into photographing, video uh, interviewing uh, World War II veterans. And so I interviewed a dozen of them and we found people at all ranges, including a three-star admiral who was on the uh, submarine uh, tracking the Red October. Oh my goodness. And I had quite an interview with him and he took me into his room where he's got all of his displays and his pictures with Nimitz and, and amazing stories. So I did 12 of those and we showed those about two hours old. And then I added them down. I did what your man was doing. I took 35 minutes. They weren't as targeted as I am. Uh, and in 35 minutes, I got a pretty good story. I added them down each to 10 minutes, and we show those on Memorial Day to packed audiences who come in and hear those interviews. In that interview, I have it on just in them and on the artifacts they showed. They, three of them wrote books, and so we were able to take pictures out of the books. So I've been doing that, but the most important thing that I may ever do in my life, if it works out, is this inside our schools. This will have far more reaching things than I think if it works. And it depends on a series of things beginning with AECT. 
if we don't get those films out of that classroom to show the whole project and all my money is wasted. Mm -hmm. So we've got to get pictures that show what the kids do and in a learner-focused environment. I used to say learner-centered, but I found that people get that confused with the center. And in the center, you can have activities that are not learner-centered. So I've changed it to learner focus. I'm focusing on what the learner does, what he learns, how he constructs his own, his own field. As when you read stories, you have to construct what you read in the visuals out of what you've got in your mind. The whole business of constructivism. So, so um, I feel that if this works and we get, there are so many benefits I can see from this. And the first basic one is the school's interpretation to the community so they can get support. That is the most basic one. And then to help other schools see what could be done. And that's where the films come in. How do you like the new technology that you've acquired here recently? You know, computer software for doing video editing and multimedia development. Well, that, as I say, I thank the Lord for letting me live to see it because the simplest program, that uh, a software program, the iMovie, and I have the other one, but uh, the iMovie, I found so many things I can do with it that I really don't need anything else. When I get into my story, <coughs> pardon me, when I get in my story, it's straight edits. I don't need dissolve the cover up. It's cutting from one shot to another if you really want to tell your story. And the iMovie enables me to get to the exact frame, the exact anything. So I think it's wonderful, but I also think that uh, we are doing things with the computer that we can do simpler, that we were doing more simpler, in a simpler way other way. And I think that the future is going to be a mix of the computer doing some wonderful things. But the individual kid down here, he's not going to, he may eventually end up with a laptop. I think the time is going to come when practically every kid's going to have, and it's, and the and the computer's going to have to get simpler and cheaper. You ought to be able to get a $150 notebook, I suppose. Uh, but long before that time comes, it's the simpler things in life that are going to be recognized again. There are things that you're doing with a computer you can do much simpler otherwise. Little games. Little games that kids should be playing with each other. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and I think, what about these individuals? I haven't been in the school lately, and I keep wondering, what's happened to the individual having an interface with a movie, a moving image? See, we thought we were doing research on the film. We were really doing research on the moving image. image yeah. And the film carried it. And it came separated when we projected on the screen. But the interface is with the, with the moving image, or with the still image, or with the color. Now, what are we doing to have the, indiv the kid get individually in touch with that moving image? You can't do it with a computer, and you don't need to do it with a computer. We used to have the little 8 millimeter movie, but now it can be uh, what the little, um, the little uh, they could have stations of, um, with the uh, DVD disc with this little screen. Are we doing that? I don't know. I think, AV had, I think AACT has a lot to do yet with getting the message to the individual kid.